This week, our special guest is Jim Skaysbrook, OAM. Mark catches up with Jim in part one of his fascinating story. And in part two, we continue the conversation with Jeff Sale. And later, Dave O. Johnson has something special in Show Us What You Got. G'day and welcome to Let's Talk Motorsport yet again. And what a cracker of a show we've got for you tonight. First up, we've got Jim Skaysbrook. Jim is a legend in Australian motorcycle racing, on the track and off the track, and was recently awarded a Order of Australia medal in the Queen's Birthdays Honours list. So what a fitting time to get him on the show and talk about his heritage and his um, history of the sport. Also, we've got part two of Jeff Sale um, going back to the Europe, also his return to Australia and um, some of those little things on and off the track. And also to wrap it up, a very special show us what you've got. This week we've got Dave o. Johnson. You know the guy, he's raced at the TT, won a classic TT and a, come third in the Superstock TT last year. He's got a very special bit of Australian motorcycle heritage. We'll catch up with him later on the show, but first up, let's have a chat with Jim. G'day Jim Skaysbrook, thanks for joining us. And before I go any further, uh, congratulations on the honour bestowed upon you recently. Well done and uh, couldn't think of anybody more deserving in the uh, motorcycle industry in Australia to get one. Thanks, Braxy. It was uh, a bit of a surprise to me, but I'm very happy to accept it. And uh, I, likewise, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad for motorcycling as well. It's, uh, it's good for, uh, to occasionally get these sort of honours in our direction. And, well, I... Uh, yeah, go on. Sorry. I was going to say there's, there's a lot of other people uh, equally deserving and, you know, let's hope that it continues. I know in the past um, there's been OAMs given out to, uh, uh, usually to people in um, official positions like people who have been presidents of MA and so forth, but there's not too many of them I don't think have gone to riders. So that's a good thing. So when did you get? Did, when did you first get an inkling that this was happening? Because um, not many of us, you know, get a, a tap on the back from the Queen every day of the week. Well, it was from the Governor General actually, but uh, yeah, that was uh, oh, about two weeks ago. I think uh, I received a, an email from the Governor General's office to ask if I would that I'd say that I'd been nominated and would I accept. Uh, so I thought for a few seconds and said yes, I'd accept. Um, and then uh, I think about less than a week ago, I got a, a reply to say that the nomination had been um, received and accepted and stand by, which happened on Monday. So who re who um, recommended you? Did you find that out? I did, yes. Um, my nomination was put in by uh, Anthony Gullick, who um, a lot of people will know Anthony. He's very... Uh, he and his brother Graham are both very uh, strong members of the vintage and veteran side of things. Um, and Anthony has been, was very instrumental in establishing the Bulleye Antique Motorcycle Weekend with the late uh, Tony Blaine. And uh, I did a, a little thing with them down there a year or so ago. He interviewed me and we bought the... Uh, the uh, Ducati 750 SS up from, from Motorcycling Australia in Melbourne and apparently went over pretty well and he was uh, encouraged to uh, submit this nomination which was secret to me but not to my wife Sue, she, she knew about it from the start so she managed to keep that secret for nearly two years. <laughs> two years, well that's pretty good. No, but yeah. um, well you've, you've had a lifetime in motorcycle and you were almost born on a motorcycle really weren't you? Yes, you could say that. I mean, I've got quite a few shots. Some of them I've uh, shared with you. Um, my father was a, a you know, particularly good um, uh, motorcycle rider. Uh, never did any road racing, but uh, seriously good on uh, scrambles, motocross and trials. 
Um, he was sponsored by the Matchless distributor for New South Wales, which is AP North, and um, he was given a, a competition model Matchless 350 in 1950, and there's a photograph of me sitting on the petrol tank of that bike. So I was I wasn't very old then. So uh, that's pretty much uh, where it started for me. So and you spent a pretty well a fair amount of time on the dirt as well. You um, did pretty well in that as well. Yes, um, my parents weren't that keen on. Well, they were keen on road racing. Everybody went to Bathurst each year and that sort of thing, but they weren't keen on me getting involved in road racing. There were too many uh, friends lost, I think, over the years with, with road racing. So they didn't mind me riding in scrambles, uh, but road, while ever I was under their roof at home, road racing was out. But um, when I was old enough, or in fact, not before I was old enough, I put my, put my age up to get my license. Um, my father built up a, a scrambled bike out of bits and pieces that were laying around in the shed. And I started racing. Uh, Moorbank was the only track in in Sydney at that stage, um, so that was where I rode, and virtually everybody rode. And um, that was where I sort of got the got the bug and and went on from there. That was in the mid sixties. So was there always a little inkling, a little uh, voice in the back of your head saying, "I want to go road racing"? Um, not initially. No, I was I was totally wrapped up in, in scrambles and uh, I did reasonably well at it and ended up being sponsored by Yamaha, which was McCulloch of Australia in those days, they were the Australian distributors. And um, uh, that was in, I think, 1968. I got one of the, given one of the new DT1 Yamahas with a factory race kit on it and it was a terrific thing. I did quite well on it and I really, you know, enjoyed riding it, even though at that point, the, the 250 class was, uh, you know, the, the place to be, and it was pretty serious competition with, uh, you know, the likes of Husqvarna and El Taco and you know, the English bikes. Uh, so the Yamaha was the first, you know, Japanese bike that uh, got to mix it with those, and it was it was, it was surprisingly good package, and, and it certainly worked for me. It certainly did. Well, it, it didn't take you long to start. Um expanding her horizons and heading overseas either, did it? Uh, no, I, um, uh, well, raced here for quite a while and had a couple of little dalliances with road racing just on friends' bikes at Oran Park, but nothing particularly serious. Uh, and I actually got given an, an Ossa road racer from the uh, distributor in, in New South Wales, which was Rob McPhail. Unfortunately, I came to a bit of a, sticky end on that because it seized at Amaru Park when I had just overtaken the travelling master, it was Tony Hatton, and uh, when I fell off right in front of him, he ran over the top of me and broke my collarbone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about the road racing, I think I'll go back to scramble, which I did. And uh, at that point, uh, you know, motocross as it was becoming then was, uh, you know, the big thing. And uh, I got sponsored by various people. John Harris uh, was one of them with Husqvarna's, uh, CZ's before that with Bill Watson. Um, so I had some good equipment for a, a quite a long time. Um, and I sort of put the inkling to, to race. I wanted to race in England. I wanted to go to England to ride motocross over there. Uh, but through one thing and another, I got sort of sidetracked with that and ended up going into business with John Harris in Sydney with a Honda dealership which, looking back, was the best thing I could have done. If I had gone to England, I would have ended up living in a bus shelter or something. And <laughs> uh, it was, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I hadn't thought that out at all. But uh, John was a pretty good businessman, and he set us up in, uh, he had a Honda shop already in Newcastle, and he set us up with a, uh, a second branch in Sydney at Gladesville, which went really well. And um, so I was able to, you know, establish myself in business and, and get set up financially uh, to the point where my, my brother was actually away in England for a couple of years. And uh, when he came back, I said, then why don't you look after the, the business for a little while because I want to go ride motocross in America. And I did that with Laurie Alderton. We went over there in 1973 and raced in the Trans AMA series, which pretty much went the length and breadth of America uh, and Canada. It was quite a long series. It was about 
I don't know, 15, 20 rounds or something. And, uh, um, it, you know, it was a real eye-opener because it's been the end of the season, the uh, end of European season, all the, all the top Europeans came over because the money was particularly good. So we were, it was Laurie and I, straight from Moorbank up against the likes of Roger DeCosta and Joel Robert and guys like that. So, you know, from the moment, the last time we saw them for the race was when the flag dropped at the start and then, you know, 30 minutes later they came thundering past us to lap us. So uh, the, the, <laughs> we gradually got better and, well, we actually, we did get a lot better and we got fitter and um, the thing that let us down, I guess, was uh, these were very long races. You know, they were 45 minutes each leg, 45 minutes plus two laps. So the, you know, basically an hour leg and you had only 40 minutes from the first leg to the second leg to get yourself back together and then off you went again. And our bikes uh, did more racing in the first few of those events than they'd probably done in the entire season before. And they just started falling to pieces. And uh, we, uh, we gradually sort of got to the point where we could finish the races without something breaking. I got to within one lap of finishing one of the events at Ohio and the seat fell off the, the, uh, the bike. So I had to sort of ride without a seat. And then virtually in the second leg in the same event, it was going okay and the chain broke on the last lap. So I was starting to think we were jinxed there. But uh, you know, eventually we, we got, got better at it, started to finish the races. Both Laurie and I got finished in the, down the lower end of the prize money scale a couple of times. And you know, we were quite happy with what we'd done. Oh, well, and the names you're dropping, the friendships you've um, created over it. But it's not just um, being on a motorbike and riding around a racetrack either, Jim. I think you're a, you're a bit of a humble man. And um, what you've done as far as, um, well, you had your advert, you got into the advertising. And from then, correct me if I'm wrong, the relationship with Vince Tesserero started. And then one thing led to another. And Vince, we know with the Mr. Motocross series, the Castrol Six Hour, you were in the the well, not the background. I'd say you were right beside him the whole time. Um, yeah, well, when I or uh, well, before I went to America, actually, I was sharing a, a house in uh, in North Sydney with Vincent and a few other blokes, and uh, it's all pretty pretty riotous times, early seventies. <laughs> uh, but uh, and Vincent was that stage; he was secretary of the Big Wallaby. District Motorcycle Club, which had eight nine hundred members, a uh, huge club that had you know divisions within it promoting road racing at Amaru Park, scrambles at Moorbank, and then later at Amaru and all kinds of things. You know, huge road riding club and massive place. And um, yeah, we so lived and breathed bikes, lived in this big house there, had parties and did all kinds of things. Um, and um, the Castrol Six Hour Race actually started slightly before Vincent came along, it was run by the uh, competitions committee, or I think that's what it was called, or, the, or the, the six hour committee or something, of the club, which was Paul Giles and Joe Eastmuir and a few other guys. Um, and they put the, the concept together for the six hour race, but it went, you know, gangbusters from the beginning to the point where it needed, um, you know, a, a professional hand on it. And Vincent sort of got into that role from about the second event onwards, I think. Um, I rode in the second and third ones of those on CB500 Hondas with Paul Giles. Um, and um, uh, it, it was a, you know, there was something happening every weekend. It was either that, Short Circuit was big, and I really enjoyed Short Circuit and really well at it. And, uh, um, and then, of course, the Mr. Motocross series, which was something that, sort of Vincent and I dreamed up as well. Uh, it sprang out of a, uh, the promotions that were going on for Emory Park uh, Motocross, which was uh, an incredibly popular circuit because it, it was a natural amphitheatre. People could see all the action and they just crammed themselves in there. Um, and we come up with this idea, which was sort of basically a speedway type format, short, four short races. And it started off with um, a New South Wales versus Victoria Thing. So Trevor Flood and uh, I think Jack Pengalli and a few others came up and I think they all stayed in the, we all stayed in the, our house in, in North Sydney and uh, got up to all kinds of mischief. So we were all feeling, <laughs> feeling a bit second <laughs> hand by the time the event came around for the weekend. But that, that actually turned out to be a really 
terrific event and, and Vincent thought, well, you know, there's, there's mileage in this. So that's where the actual Mr. Motocross format sprang from and it went on, as you know, to become you know, the biggest uh, motocross event by far in the country and, you know, eclipsed the national titles. And, uh, you know, guys like Stephen Gall and... and um, uh, Oh, heaps of others. Jeff Leask, yeah, there's, um, yeah, Vandenberg, the heaps of them. Yeah. yeah, they all made their names there and we went on to much better things. Yeah, it was, um, I suppose it was also the halcyon days of motorcycling on the road, you know, you, you had the crowds, you don't see that anymore. I think there's a lot more things to do these days than what that was, but they really, the Mr. Motocross, I remember going to a few of them, the the pomp and ceremony and the, the you know, you had the Golden Breed, all these outside sponsors that came into it, and as well as what happened with the outside sponsorship of the Castrol Six Hour. It was on national television, live coverage for years if you couldn't get to the track on the ABC. Um, you really, I suppose you guys came along just at the right time and with the right, I suppose the universe came together for a lot of people, didn't it, that, at that time? And that's exactly a pretty... Right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the uh, around 73, 4, 5 was the big sales period for motorcycles. You know, they were selling 100,000 new bikes per year, uh, registered bikes. Um, yeah, never got near that since, I don't think. Um, so the trade was booming, but what... Uh, Vincent largely did with the Mr. Motocross series was he got people from outside the trade, like the Grace Brothers uh, chain of stores and um, Pepsi Cola, um, firms like that that just hadn't been involved in motorcycling really uh, up to that point. And, and that, and he did in store promotions, uh, you know, took the star riders along to the, and did you know, in-store shopping centre promotion, stuff that hadn't been done before, and basically took the sport to a whole new audience. That was the secret of that, and that's why it, it succeeded in the way it did. Do you think that's what's missing now? Is that, um, or is it just that there's too many other things to be doing for people? Uh, both, I think, yeah. The, like the, the, the concept of, you know, going out every weekend to a motorbike race, I think, is sort of pretty much finished and um, uh, I think people are just in a different mindset these days that they expect things to be on television and they'll click through 50 channels till they find what they want. Um, back in those days it was just something that everybody did, you know, every weekend you had to go somewhere to see something. Um, there was so much sport on and uh, motorcycle sport on. Um, I, I don't know that you can ever replicate that on like on a national basis you still obviously get people uh, along to MotoGP and things like that but that's like a once a year um, thing where you can save up and get your holidays or whatever and go along to it but you know not just I'm not just talking in New South Wales or Sydney I mean, I'm talking nationally in the 70s it was something every weekend and, and in all sorts of different aspects of it with short circuit or dirt track or scrambles or, or road racing or anything you know it was all there. Now, another thing, we you mentioned some of the friends you've uh, um, had lifelong associations with, but one that is very special to you, and I, that comes out in one of your books, is uh, your relationship with Mike the Bike, Mike Harwood. That must have been, uh, at times for you, you would have been pinching yourself, I think, wouldn't you, with um, getting to know and become great mates with such a person? Oh, definitely. Um, that that was came out of a... a um, chain of events that I couldn't predict, but it was during the, by that stage, this was in, you know, 77, I think, uh, uh, I was running my businesses and pretty tied up, but I still did a lot of historic racing because that was getting established at that stage and, and it was something that interested me and I had some bikes um, and it just coincided with Mike Halewood uh, uh, having his career which was Formula One at that stage, um, uh, curtailed because of a big serious accident. And he'd moved to New Zealand and pretty much was trying to make a clean start. But he he was, uh, wasn't was very good at just sitting around. And he, he got um, itchy feet in the moment that somebody approached him um, to come over here to uh, uh, ride and drive at the uh, Amaru Park All Historic Meeting in 1977. He jumped at it and he came over here and really had a ball 
not just on the track, but he just <laughs> felt so naturally and um, uh, turned out at that meeting I won the main race and he was he was second and uh, so that was a that was the first time I had to pinch myself um, and then he you know he'd obviously had a good time and was up for a bit more of it and so he came back a couple of months later and rode at Bathurst in the same event they actually put a special event on that had historic demonstrations for a race before that they made this one a race and as it turned out it was the same result I won it again. So we sort of, you know, we sort of became a bit of a double act, I suppose, and um, and got to be quite good friends. And uh, then shortly after that, uh, quite separate to me and to Mike, there was a plan put together by radio announcer Owen Delaney um, to encourage Mike to ride in the Castrol Six Hour Race because obviously it was the biggest road race at the time, and it was right on his doorstep. And he sort of thought about it for a while. The original plan was Owen just Owen put it to him that he and Mike would ride together. But I think Owen realised fairly soon that he was probably not going to uh, make the grade in terms of what was required in riding. And anyway, he came up with this idea to put the two of us together. And um, so that happened. Uh, a team was put together out of Newcastle with 750SS Ducati. Um, and... It was always very laid back uh, compared to the other teams in the six hour, particularly the top teams who took it very, very seriously. Um, Mike said originally that he would agree to do it as long as it wasn't too serious and he could have some fun. So that was the ethos of the whole thing, it had to be fun. And, you know, it, it was fun. Looking back on that race, I wish it, we had it taken it slightly more seriously because we, we didn't even do a, a fuel test to see how long we could run the bike. And we ended up doing uh, one stop longer than what we needed to make, which is you know, a few minutes. And we ended up, we were uh, sixth outright um, and we could have easily been several places higher than that. We had just taken it a bit more seriously, but it didn't matter. We had a great time. Um, and, and, you know, Mike was after that, or at, about that time, was starting to really get keen to, uh, you know, do more racing, uh, and there was a scheme being cooked up overseas to get him to the Isle of Man in 1978, uh, which he obviously did and famously won the, the TT Formula One race. And during that period, he sort of jokingly said to me, you know, you should go over and have a ride in that too. And, and I said, oh, yeah. And uh, uh, again, slightly out of my control, there was a bit of a deal put up to get a hold of a... a, a, a NCR 860 Ducati, virtually the same as Mike's one, um, supplied out of the factory. Uh, and uh, so that was made available and that was where I ended up riding. What an enthralling interview. A walking, talking encyclopedia of Australian motorcycle racing. We'll catch up with part two of Jim next week, but in the meantime, here's part two of our entertaining interview and conversation with Jeff Sale. So what made you um, come back to the, the 350s and the 250s? Uh, all about finances. The 750 World Championship sort of lasted till about 79. It was either 500s, 250 or 350s. I went down the path to start with the riding a 350 because that's really all you could afford. Um, then the next thing became trying to get starts at Grand Prix. That wasn't an easy task at the time, but because I'd done a bit of groundwork in 78 with my 750, I managed to get a start. My first Grand Prix was at the Salzburg Ring in Austria. And I put that down to mainly that the year before I did a 750 International and went fairly well and the organisers knew me, so I got a start there. And from there I battled. I didn't get a start at the next couple of Grand Prix. Then I got into another one and as soon as you get a result of sort of top 10, you start to get a few more starts. So I think the first year in 79, I didn't do the whole season, but I did enough to come 10th in the World Championship. So the next year, that gave me automatic starts. And from there on, it was a matter of riding the 250s and the 350s. I had one season on a TZ500, which in saying that TZ750 was the best production motorcycle Yamaha made, 
the TZ500 was by far the worst. So that turns into a bit of disaster. And, and from there on, I just kept going on the 250s and 350s. And what a lot of people wouldn't understand, I suppose people younger than us, and we're up there in the, the older age bracket, is that back then um, you were doing the races in between the Grand Prix to get some start money and some prize money. And also back then they were giving you start money and qu I think qualifying money at one stage to... Um, to, and that was basically financing you to put fuel in the transit van or whatever you're travelling around with and then get to the next race. When I won the Marlborough Series and I went across to England, because of the publicity it received in England and Europe, um, when it came to try and get starts, yeah, we all tried to get some start money to pay the bills like that. But I think when I first started, I was on... 200 pound I used to get when I raced at most of the tracks in England. The Isle of Man, what you said before, the Isle of Man was a necessity for most of us in that I used to get about 4,000 pounds to start, which was a guarantee. So if I didn't win that in prize money, I was guaranteed 4,000 pounds. That's a and lot of that, money in those uh, days. There was a lot of schooners, Bracty. <laughs> or pints, as it may be. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but if you did the old man and got paid that, that would pay for the season. So that's why, other than I wanted to do it to start with and, and had some reasonable results there, that was another reason why some people did it, to pay for the rest of the year. Sort of went through a period that in the first year I did the Grand Prix. You didn't get start money or things like that. But the second year, because I'd finished 10th, they had to pay you start money. But then the next year, they changed it all and went to more prize money and things like that. So it became more performance-based, which was good, because at a lot of the time, there was a lot of guys that got into those positions, didn't have the right bikes, but just kept turning up to get their start money. So with the doing that, besides that, you also raced at Spa, which had, I suppose back then was the original long, the very long circuit, wasn't it? Before they... Um, um, I, missed, I missed by a year. Ah, oh, you missed by a year. So you would have liked to have done the, the big circuit. Again, I went round there in the car. We went there in 79 or 80, I think, my first one on the new track. We went round the old track and that was a track. I mean... I think the average speed, 137 mile an hour mm. on a 500. Something and ridiculous, yeah. No runoff. And, I mean, that's probably one of the first tracks that got cold in all this safety thing that Sheeny and Kenny and all them. And, and I think it was mainly Kenny Roberts went there and he's seen it and just go, why are we racing on this? So the next year, Spa actually made a, a – used a little part of that circuit and made a new part but they only resurfaced it about two weeks before the event and then a lot of the 500s protested and walked out anyway because it was too slippery. Wow, yeah, there would have been some scary times then. And I tell you, the, uh, we've been focusing on my racing a bit, but the social bit of the names you're mentioning, you, you uh, sound like you've ended up with good mates with a few of the guys that are now um still involved in the sport some are no longer with us and everything but the traveling to and between races would have been uh, another adventure just in itself it, it was and i think we all made the most of it i mean you're either racing driving partying barbecue race party barbecue i mean great times i mean i suppose the biggest character that i ever came across the whole time i was there was steve parish and we travelled with Steve a lot and we had a lot of great fun. Um, but, yeah, the downside and also that is that you make a lot of friends and whilst I was racing in Europe, you see a lot of them get killed, which is the hard part of the sport. And I don't say you get blasé about it, but it, it's one of those things you think, well, it's never going to happen to me. But I mean, for instance, I think the first year I went to the Isle of Man, there was five people killed in a two-week period, which... One of the guys that from New Zealand was staying with us and I spent two weeks with him in a house in Ramsey and he got killed the last day of the last race. So good times, yes, but sobering times at other times.
Was on very sobering times, especially when you're basically living in each other's pockets and hopping each other out. In saying that, well, you, I think you did, what, three or four years at the Isle of Man? Um, was there any times in those things when you went, I don't know if this is for me, or is it one of those things where you just go, well, like you said, it's not going to happen to me, and that's the way that you, your psyche, psyche dealt with those um, very tragic times? Yeah, I think you've, you've got to put it in the back of your mind. That I don't think you think it's not going to happen to me. Just sub, you just don't. It's not going to happen. Um, I, the turning point came in, I think, 82 was my last year at the TT. And I just thought I'd had some reasonably good results. I had a few fourths, fifths and things like that. I'd had a couple of races where where I really should have come second, but we had a little problems with the bike, but that happens. And I just saw in 82, it was virtually starting to get that it might have been my last year in Europe. I mean, that's, and I just thought I'll go to the Isle of Man and, and try and a race. And because I went with that little bit of attitude, I started to make a few mistakes and I still did okay, but it sort of put it in to a bit of perspective. I mean, a lot of us know Kenny Blake, great rider from Victoria, was killed there. I was in that race, and Kenny and I were great friends. So some of those things occur, and once they start to get into your mind, I think, well, okay, better off doing something else. And well, saying, with still staying in Europe for the time being, when you went from a track like that or the Northwest or whatever, when you got onto a proper purpose-built Grand Prix track, um relax is probably the wrong word to use but did you feel more comfortable did you think you can push a little bit harder because of uh, and bearing in mind that a lot of those places didn't have nowhere near the runoff we've got now as well and then you also had that I don't know if you would have uh, raced in the Czech Republic or the Czechoslovakia back then and the old Breno road circuit I went for a drive around there when I was there a few years ago now and it was like the pits are still there they've still got the pit lane and everything there on the main road and then you follow up into the hills. I think that was about eight, nine miles long. And beside that, and Saxon Ring, the old Saxon Ring track was another one. You just got pine trees from like three foot off the track. But when you got into a proper track, well, I don't know if you'd call Salzburg a proper track, but the old Hockenheim, <laughs> um, all those tracks, was it? did it put you a bit more of a different frame of mind? Oh, I think you attacked those tracks a little bit different. I, I went... No, I'll put it this way. I think those tracks rode at percent, 110%. When you raced at the, the Isle of Man, the Nor, not so much the Norwest 200, that was not super, super dangerous. It was just super quick. But the Ulster Grand Prix, I don't think you rode 10 tenths. It was more of an eight, nine tenths thing around the butt parts that you knew you tried fairly hard, but some of those tracks, I mean, the Isle of Man, you can go there for four or five years and you still don't know the limit you can go on some of the corners. Um, when you mentioned Checo, I did ride, ride at the old Checo, the one through the villages. I did that a couple of years and I think the first year I went, or the second year I went there, I ended up third in the 350 Grand Prix, which was a bit of a highlight. and. But, yeah, it was completely different, different country, different people, obviously communist at the time, so it's a different culture, um, but still a lovely place and lovely people that don't get to see, at the time didn't get to see a lot of sporting heroes or sportsmen turn up and do their thing. But the, I think just the fact that when you've got the, a proper circuit, that, yeah, you try your 110%. And on the road circuits, they're a bit dangerous. You probably try eight to nine. What was your favourite track over there? Uh, Assen was my favourite track, probably because I had really good results there. I mean, that often get asked, "What's your favourite track?" Well, I think your favourite track is represented by what your results are. Um, Assen was my favourite, even though the first year I went there on a 750 and didn't qualify because every session of the 750 World Championship at that time was qualifying. There was no in-between, no warm-up things or just go out and do your thing. 
And the first session I went out in, I had a few problems with the bike. So we still put it out and still learning the track. And every session after that, it rained. So you don't qualify, you don't get any money. You don't, but I still love the laying of the track. The atmosphere at the Grand Prix there is just unbelievable. And yeah, to have some really good results there, that'd be well into my favourite circuit anywhere in the world. And that was when Assen was Assen, when it was that very long track. Um, they, to me, they took the heart out of it in 2006 when they basically cut it in half. They destroyed the Struben, that um, infamous corner that was um, recognisable. And any time you saw a photo of the Struben, you know which corner it was. And that run out the back section, and part of it was now it was lucky to be 10 foot wide, I think, in some parts of the track. But that for a closed circuit was probably as close as you got to a road racing circuit in a, on a Grand Prix track, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, when I first went to Assen, it was the old, I think, 12 Ks or 10 Ks. It was not roads, but yeah, they built a few of the things, but I'd compare it to the width of it was like going down the old Hume Highway in the 1950s and going down the freeway now in 2000s is what the track's like now. Yeah. The yeah. track would have to be six or seven times wider than when we went there. You'd almost, in some parts of the track, you couldn't have cars, two cars going opposite directions. One would have to pull into the grass. But it was a fantastic track. It was flat. It was fast. It had some slow. Like I said, when your results are good somewhere, you do like it. Now, just going back to the Isle of Man quickly, when you look at modern day footage of the Isle of Man and you were there 40 years ago racing and chasing your dream, do you sit there agog and think, how do they do those speeds now on those, okay, the bikes and technology is a lot better, but back then I don't think, no, you wouldn't have even had a 120 mile an hour lap average, would you, back then on the, the big bore bikes, whereas now what, Hickman last year, I think 134 mile an hour average. It's just, even I'm a wood duck and I'd sit there and go and watch the videos, <laughs> but you've been there, done it, raced there and everything. You've got a completely different perspective to what I ever have. I've only driven around and ridden around it on a motorbike. Um, to race it at the speeds you did in those days and then to see the guys doing it now, like Dave o. Johnson and Cohen, and what they're doing is just, um, well, incomprehensible to me at times. Um, I can't really say what I think of these guys now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> it was, it's the same again, though, Mark. The, the track's a bit wider in some spots. I mean, in other spots, it's very much the same as when when I rode there. Yeah, it might be a bit smoother in spots like this. But I think when I was there, if about 110 was the lap record when I first went there, and I think it ended up, the last year I did was about 115. To these guys to be doing 134 and watching the footage of it is just nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only and one that thinks in, like that. <laughs> and in reality, they're just on a modified type road bike. I mean, that's the scary part compared to we were just on full blown race bikes. Yeah. It's, it's madness at the moment. It is, it is. But um, as um, it was told to me when I first went there in 1989 that you don't, no one uh, cable ties your hands to the handlebars. It's um, you make the decision and you go out there and have fun. And um, yeah, and you've, um, you did that quite well. Yeah, I had some pretty good success there and success at Assen. Um, 10th in the World Championship, 5th in the World Championship, 9th in a World Championship. So. I gave it a go, uh, tried my best, probably and could have done things a little differently, but that's me and that's the way I get back now. So I don't yeah. regret a lot of what I didn't do or did do. I mean, that's life. People yeah. make mistakes or do this, but yeah. I saw the world because I could ride a motorbike. And then you came back to Australia and... Well, you, you did pretty well here for a, a few years, particularly on the Celastic uh, Yamaha. Um, won a ch uh, when did you win the championship on that? 2005, um, 1985, I think you won the 250 um, GP title. Yeah, I won, I won, well, I won about three, three or four of them, I think. No, 
And yeah, I think I won six overall. So I think I won two before I went. I think I won in 75. I won the 350 Australian Championship. And 76, I won the 500. So after I come back, I think um, the one thing I'll say is I left Europe in 83. I raced, I went over in 83 to ride a bike, which didn't turn out to be what we thought it was going to be. So I didn't do any races in 83 in Europe. Um, and it's the only thing that surprised me was I was saying that in 82, halfway through the season, I was third in the World Championship. And in 1984, I didn't have a ride. That was probably hard to take, but that's the way the economics and the finances and things were there. I came back to Australia and had um, fortune to catch up with Dick Hunter, who was a really good sponsor at the time. Supplied me with a 250 Yamaha and rode that for about four or five years with pretty good success, lots of fun times. And, teaching a lot of uh, what it was all about so and I rode up to 89 and probably the reason one of the reasons I did quit was yeah I was sort of partying too much probably but I thought to myself in 89 that I got beat by a young fellow called Daryl Beatty and I thought I'm not going to keep riding these things and get beat by these kids and well <laughs> as history tells it I think about <laughs> Eight or two years later, he was winning 500 Grand Prix. So. Yeah, he, he had a little bit of talent, the old Daz, yeah. So um, you, you, once you left the track, you basically left the track. We didn't see you much back there at all sort of thing. And, uh, well, you've been busy work, having a working life as well. Yeah, I hung around for the next year. I helped um, Andrew Thompson from Queensland on a, a 250 in Rowan Pass. But yeah, as my kids at the time were starting to get older, so then your focus has to turn to them into the little athletics and tennis and soccer and things like that. And that and work, I, had, uh, I got a job at the end of 83 from a friend of mine called Mark Briggs, who owns Fiber Flash, which you've heard of. Yep. Um, he used to make, he started out as the person that made all the fairings and things like that, then got into waterproofing. So he gave me a start at the end of 83 when I came back from Europe and I'm still working there today and that's what I'm doing here. I'm in my little office out the back because of the virus and still working for Fiberless. So that's 37 years. He's going to give me a medal soon. So. Well, I'd be using yeah, a good little bonus was, after putting up with him for that long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, more so you have to look after your kids and do that. And then, yeah, I used to go to a lot of the Grand Prix at one stage. And then you got more work, more commitments, more of this. I mean, not everybody can have your life, mate. <laughs> not everybody would want my life, mate, I can tell you. It might look good, but uh, yeah, we won't go into the financial bonuses of it all. But with your kids, <laughs> <laughs> did they show any inkling like you were saying you your dad was into it and all that sort of thing. Did that your kids ever have any um, inkling to go into uh, racing, whether on the dirt or on the tar, and do something with it? Nah, well, my son was interested. Um, not to the point of actually racing, but he probably made more money out of than me by buying secondhand bikes and selling them a couple of months later and making a fortune. So... He did that. He, he's still in dirt. He goes to different meetings here and there, but he's got a couple of bikes himself, like little dirt bikes that he's trying to do up and go out. But, yeah, not not to the point where um, he wanted to race, no. But, mate, really good to talk to you. Um, I'm sure we'll get you yeah, back on you. soon. And, uh, yeah, all the best, and hopefully see you at a track very, very soon. All right, Braxy, thanks very much. Cheers, mate, no worries. Well, Jeff's another one that we could spend hours talking to. No doubt I'm going to get him back on because there's some great stories that he's yet to unleash and let us know, well, there's only so many that he can tell, I suppose. But now it's up to Davo to show us what he's got.
How you going guys? Dave A. Johnson here from Rich Energy OMG Racing and uh, this is a little video I'm doing for Let's Talk Motorsports and uh, show us what you got. Um, Braxy uh, asked me to do it and I'm gladly accept for that legend so um, yeah I'll show you this is, uh, this is my shed. This is a uh, you know, location in Adelaide but um, south of Adelaide I'll give you that much but um, yeah, this is our family house, and I got married in here in February. Or oh, married down the road, but the reception in here, 200 people in here, so it was uh, plenty of room for activities. <laughs> so it was, it was good. But um, what I want to show you, this is the, uh, the definitely the jewel of my collection. Most of these are my dad's. Uh, I've got a couple in here that he, he lets me put in in his pride pride collection. But uh, yeah, this is definitely the number one in my collection is um, the old Anset Air Freight Suzuki from uh, 1993 and a full factory machine from uh, Mick Hone Racing ridden by the late great Kurt McCarthy so um, there's a fair story about how I even got it like it, it got found by a good friend of mine Gary Loner in a, in a wreckers believe it or not a wreckers here in Adelaide and um, I uh, know known Gary a long time and I raced for him in 2001 in the Australian Championship here. It was the last time I raced in the Australian Championship, 2001 in Supersport. And um, yeah, and then went to, I went overseas in 2002. So um, he's had it in his shed. He built it up as, as a race bike, but not knowing what it was. He knew it was something pretty special, but um, had no idea about exactly what it was and, and who rode it. Um, but every time I went to his house, I uh, I always wanted just to go into his shed and suss out exactly, uh, or suss out the bike and, and have a look at it. And I was always trying to work out what it was and do some research and, until I actually made an offer that he accepted to buy it, which uh, all the other offers he didn't accept because um, he wanted loads of cash for it. So eventually made a, a nice offer, which I said yes to. And um, then I went out trying to work out exactly what it was and um, went through hundreds of Australian motorcycle news magazines of like um, I heard it got ri written in like 94 um, even 91 so there was a lot of magazines I had to go through all sorts of not just Australian motorcycle news other ones as well and um, eventually on the front of a late 1993 magazine after, um, after the last Australian Championship round um, I saw Kurt McCarthy on the big 13 machine on the on the front cover is this exact how it looks at the front doing a massive wheelie and um, luckily inside was a full write-up that uh, that Kirk and Ken Wooden the late Ken Wooden did and Ken Wooden wrote it and took uh, photos with the fairings off and everything so um, the photos were detailed enough uh, to even some of the scratches on the frame we could authenticate it by the scratches which are as clear as day um, so that tool told me exactly that it was this bike and um, I'm very happy that I found it and I mean, it was a no-brainer for me to do it exactly how Kurt McCarthy last rode it. He's a, a hero of mine. I never got the, the opportunity or the honour of meeting him but um, living, I've been living in the UK racing for the last 18 years so um, I've got a lot of friends that, that speak extremely highly of Kurt and um, on and off the track. On the track, it was amazing. Off the track, it was amazing as well. It was a right character, and the stories are probably more so with him off the track than on the track, because on the track, he's just winning. So it was uh, off the track, he was, uh, was a proper lad. So that was cool. And um, yeah, like I say, no brainer for me to do it in his honor. And um, Marty Redshaw from Underground Designs here in Adelaide did all the artwork with help from Mick Hone and Scott Williamson, who, who did all the, the artwork originally. But um, a lot, most rounds it changed because every time he, he crashed the bike, Scott just did it, sort of just freehanded everything. So we we had the photos from that uh, that article, that write up in Motorcycle News in the end of '93, and this is exactly how it was then. Like um, I mean, down to the the old school shell oils. I mean, it's anyone. I mean, there was one guy that um, sort of said it wasn't right, but I'll challenge that because. He doesn't know shit. This is exactly how it was. It changed a lot from the start of the year to the end of the year, but this is exactly how it ended the season. So, um, 
Yeah, it's good that Mick Hone also, yeah, he authenticated the bike and helped out a bit. And, and um, there's a few little bits I've got to do as well. Um, like there's a couple of bits that aren't quite right that I know Mick's got some parts and also, um, yeah, some other people. So it all just comes down to it, but I'm definitely gonna get it done in honor of Kirk because uh, he's an absolute legend and this is the, the jewel of my collection. So um, that's the one I wanted to show you mainly. It's, uh, there's a few other bikes in here, old Honda 4, which I just finished the other day. Oh, the um, benefits of, well, the very few positives of coronavirus. I've been in the shed a lot. I finished a little 125 on GP bike I got upstairs in this Honda 4. It um, started off from a dad's collection. And it was some, it was all black, so he, he's more into his um, his genuine bike, so I bought it off him and turned it into a cafe racer, and I'm heaps happy with that, it's awesome. And then uh, this piece that I've just been working on today, I've been working on the exhaust, just chopping it and getting it to fit this one. It's a T140 frame, oil in the oil in the frame model. And now uh, I've cut it, turned it into a mono shot. That's uh, what I can do on my, on my, on my fitter and turning um, apprenticeship, which I did before I went to the UK. Um, I'm a machinist as well and a welder, so I can uh, do a fair bit, which is good. Keeps me busy, definitely during this crappy period. I made these uh, the yokes as well. The uh, both top and bottom yokes. I made them in the UK when uh, this place I used to work at. Uh, but in the early days, I uh, he still lets me go in there and just mess about. But um, yeah, this is one that I'm uh, definitely work on. I made that seat as well, which I'm pretty happy with. Worked out quite well. But um, yeah, so that's a couple of bikes. I mean they're. This is, uh, have a look at some of my dad's old bikes as well. This is his main collection, which uh, I'm sort of getting there with my collection. Definitely have to win a few TTs to uh, to get to that sort of level, but um, I'm getting there. I've won classic TT, so I'm on my way. But um, yeah, we should, I should have been at the TT right now, which is uh, disappointing, but we'll have to wait till next year. But Macau Grand Prix will hopefully go ahead this year and I'll um, be going back to the UK uh, later this year to join my OMG Rich Energy Racing team and uh, they've got brand new BMWs and also um, uh, Yamaha Super Sport machines so yeah that's it well I hope you enjoyed it guys if you want to know more just uh, put some messages in the comments of this video and uh, I'll try and get back to you and if you want to see some more bikes just uh, give Braxy a holler and I'll uh, go through a few more but um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to really show you this beast. It's um, yeah, definitely close to my heart as a one of my heroes' bikes, and it's just just crazy that I've I've got it here. So um, yeah, it's one of them um, yeah sort of a find of the century, really. I think, but um, yeah, to do it with Kirk in Kirk's honour is uh, is awesome. So yeah, I'm very happy with it, and thanks for everyone that helped out as well, Marty from Underground and Mick Hone and. Scott Williamson and everybody and Gary Loner for selling it to me initially. I think it's spewing now, he realizes exactly what it was. But um, this is mine now, so uh, yeah, I'll get it running and I'll take it to, I'm hoping to take it to the Island Classic the start of next year and just show it to, show it to everybody and um, yeah, make us all enjoy it as much as I do. So yeah, uh, take it easy, hope you're all good and all the best. Well, not a bad show after all with Jim Scaisbrook and Jeff Sale and Davo Johnson. Uh, those guys make all a bit of their own personal history of Australian motorcycle road racing. Remember, before I go, we've got our socials. We've got letstalkmotorsport.com.au where you can look at all the previous episodes as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, all our podcasts are on different platforms from Spotify all the way through if you're in your car and you want to listen to some of the interviews we've done. And after seeing Davo show us what you've got, we still want to hear from you. We know there's loads of uh, little bits of uh, nostalgia and personal favourites in the shed. So pull them out, whether it's a go-kart, a car or a race bike, and show us what you've got. Until next time, it's Mark Brack signing off.